Good morning. Welcome to our service this morning. We welcome our regular parishioners, also those who are joining us from a variety of other places. Uh, we're delighted that you're watching along with us today. Just a few announcements before we begin our worship. I refer you for most of these to our website www.sego.co.uk. You can find lots of information there about what's going on in the life of our church. In particular to highlight for you on Monday evenings we continue with the Diocesan Online Alpha course. On Tuesday and Wednesday we're running the Bible course from Bible Society. This is the last week. It has been a really interesting course. Lots of people involved in that and in next week's service we hope to hear from some of them what their thoughts about that are. On Thursday we have Coffee with the Curate. We thank Stuart for his ongoing work and that opportunity to open God's Word over a cup of coffee. So as, as I've said, all the details on our website www.sego.co.uk. Also, if you want to follow us on Facebook, Sego Parish, uh, lots of bits of information there for you. And for our young people, information that comes up on the Facebook page, Sego Light. Last week we had two sing-along uh, hymns during our service and we thought because some people don't like singing or feel that they wouldn't want to upload a video of themselves that we would do something a lot simpler and so we're encouraging simply to take a photograph of yourself you might want to smile uh, you might want to wave and simply to get a photograph of that and then send it through to me so that we can put some of those together as part of a welcome over some of the coming weeks we miss seeing one another and that would be an opportunity to fill our screens with some familiar faces. So very easy to do. Take a photograph, email it to me, terence at sego.co.uk and please spread the word about that and encourage people to take part in that. We pause for a moment before we begin our worship. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that we can come together to worship you. We pray that you would be with us in our homes as we join in today. Move among us by your spirit. Reassure us of the unity that we have in Christ and help us to open ourselves to all that you want to do in and through us by your Holy Spirit, in whose name we pray. Amen. We're going to have our first hymn now, which is from Thanks and Praise, number 88, King of Kings, Majesty. It's a marvellous hymn that helps us to think about the majesty of God, the privilege that is ours in knowing him, and in all that he has done in showing his love to save us and to draw us into his presence. All we simply do is to bow before him and give him our lives. King of Kings, Majesty.
a great hymn of God's goodness. Last week was Trinity Sunday when we think of how God has revealed himself to us as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. As we now move through the church calendar on the Sundays after Trinity, we think of the unfolding life of the church empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so our theme today is about the gospel message going out into all nations. And Stuart will be helping us to think about the call upon the disciples and upon all of us to make Jesus known in our locality and then further beyond that. And so we have the greeting. May the grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord be with you and also with you. And sentences from scripture, from Ephesians and from Romans. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own, own doing. It is the gift of God. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so we pray together. Gracious God, gracious God, as we gather here to worship you, make us thankful for your special gifts. Make us aware of our many failings, humble to receive forgiveness and open to the Holy Spirit who fills us with your life and love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Acknowledging God as Trinity, the God of love, we think from Scripture of how it is only by His grace that we can seek His blessing in our lives and His forgiveness. From Titus chapter 2 verse 11 we read, The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all. That grace then leads us into His presence, seeking His forgiveness, restoration in our relationship and the empowering to move forward as God's forgiven people. And so as we celebrate the grace and goodness of God, we remember before him our sins and weaknesses. And so we pray, Father God, we confess that we often take the gifts of your creation for granted and use them chiefly to further our own interests. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Saviour Christ, we confess that we often give in to the selfish desires of our hearts and the uncaring ways of the world. Christ, have mercy. 
Christ, have mercy. And Holy Spirit, we confess that we often close our minds to your influence and fail to bear good fruits in our lives. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And so may the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of his Spirit all our days. Amen. The Old Testament reading for today is read for us by Paula. The reading can be found in Exodus chapter 19, beginning at verse 2. They set out from Raphidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Thank you, Paula. The New Testament reading for today is read for us by Graham and one of his sons, Isaac. The reading is from Matthew chapter 9, starting at verse 35. The workers of you. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore to send out workers into, into his harvest field. Jesus sends out the twelve. Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of, Ke the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Isaac, and thank you, Graham. We respond as we sing the words from St. Patrick's Breastplate in our hymn books, hymn number 322, and this is verse 8. There are nine verses in all, but we're just focusing on one. Verse 8, Christ be with me. Oh, God. 
Now we hand over to Stuart for the sermon. Good morning everyone. It might seem strange if you know anything about the church liturgical calendar, you'll have noticed that we seem to be moving back a little bit in the timeline of Jesus as we look at our readings this week. Over the last few weeks we have been witness to the ascension of Jesus and the birthday of the church. And we had that wonderful pause where we reflect upon the nature of the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, which was explained so well to us last week by Terence. And this week, our Gospel reading takes us back to Matthew chapter 9 and 10. On the surface, it might seem a little disjointed, yet when you read the Gospel and you understand the context, it makes perfect sense not only in the light of our response as Christians, but also our response to the ascendant Christ and also to the spirit-filled church on the day of Pentecost. So some context for us as we uh, begin to think about our reading today. Jesus has spent some time earlier in the Gospel of Matthew gathering his disciples and they're all kind of new to, to, to following Jesus. Yet Jesus does what he does best and he leads by example. He shows them what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Now rabbis of the time would often invite their students to take on what was known as their yoke. And this was a way of saying to students, here are all of my teachings, now you take them on. Listen to them, understand them, ask questions about them. And then go on apply them to your lives and your religious practice. Once a student was able to do these things, they took on their rabbi's yoke. So it is that we see Jesus, who admittedly has subverted the rabbinical traditions by not recruiting the best as other rabbis were prone to do, but arguably going out of his way to rec recruit the least prepared, the least equipped uh, of the people he might have been able to find and he's asked these people to come and be his students. Yet what we see here in the lead up to our reading is that Jesus teaches his disciples. He unpacks to them what it means to be his disciple and what his yoke looks like. These disciples ask many questions. Jesus gives them answers. And he demonstrates the power he will move in. And then we get to this pivotal moment. It's not enough for these men to learn at the feet of Jesus. It's not enough for them to see Jesus' power demonstrated. It's not enough for them to understand and take upon themselves the burden of Jesus' yoke or teachings. No, in this pivotal moment, Jesus tells his disciples that they are needed, that they must go and speak to the truth and power and of all that they have seen. And there's two very important aspects that we must consider as we reflect upon the call that Jesus places upon his disciples, both then and now. Firstly, we see the compassion of Jesus. And secondly, we see the commission of Jesus. In verse 36, we read these words. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. This is a familiar theme when it comes to how Jesus views the crowds. The verb had compassion that's used here has the same sense as what we might say is a gut reaction. It's not something that Jesus has to intellectually think through, but rather it's an innate response he has to those he comes into contact with. This sense is almost always used in reference to Jesus with a few examples uh, in some of the parables and is reinforced by the image of the sheep without a shepherd. Something that's most commonly associated with the Old Testament as a 
shorthand almost for the failure of the political and spiritual leaders in their duty to take care of the people. In this, we, we might draw a parallel with our own culture. In such times when we feel bereft of leadership, be it spiritual or political, we can have that assurance that Jesus is the shepherd who will have compassion on us and take care of us in our times of need. So Jesus' concern then is thus reinforced in his next statement as he reflects on the work to be done. Driven by his compassion, he notes in verses 37 and 38 that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And he carries on, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. For Jesus, feelings of compassion are only part of the story. Compassion gives us concern, which drives us to commit to a course of action in response. Compassion is the soil in which our ministry, our mission, our calling takes root and grows. And so it begs a question of each one of us today. What are the things that drive us to feel compassion? What are the causes or the people groups that we feel a yearning deep inside of us to support? What are the injustices that drive us to want to see change? What are the things that God may be laying on your heart, even now in this moment? Our compassion for the world around us is integral to the calling God gives to us. Compassion is what leads to commission. Some scholars refer to this portion of Matthew's gospel as the little commission. Little because, of course, it is a precursor to the great commission that we're well acquainted with. That commission that Jesus gives at the end of his earthly ministry, where he commands his disciples to go into the world. But little because also its focus is particularly on the Jewish people. In verses 5 and 6 we read, These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. It can seem somewhat at odds, especially in light of the Great Commission, where the command is to go to all nations. Yet I think it's for a pragmatic reason that Jesus issues this commission. You may have heard the saying, walk before you can run. And it would be my sense here that Jesus is sending out his disciples in a context that would seem comfortable to them before they are sent completely out of their comfort zones later on. And that's an important thing for us to reflect upon today. Just what exactly are the limits of our comfort zones? What are the boundaries beyond which we feel uncomfortable? I believe with all my heart that God wants to use his people, his church, in mighty and incredible ways. I believe that for many of us, if not all of us, that call upon our lives will stretch us, will bring us to people and places That may even surprise us, but we can take comfort for as the Lord calls us, he also equips us. Yet also each one of us has that safe space where we don't necessarily feel nervous or stretched. On a deeper level, as we look at this little commission to go out to their own people, we can be reminded of the people right on our own doorsteps, our family, our neighbours. Our, our friends, those who inhabit the space around us. Sometimes mission isn't something uh, that takes place over there in some foreign land to an exotic people, but rather we can be called to engage a mission right here in the mundaneness of our own lives, standing round the water cooler in work, sitting at the, the lunch table in school, when we're out watering plants, when we acknowledge our neighbours. It's not to say that that those things, those prospects, aren't scary in and of themselves, but sometimes we celebrate the mission field and the work that takes place in it when it's thousands of miles away and that only some of us have the, the privilege and the opportunity to be a part of. 
And sometimes we forget about the mission field that's right on our own doorsteps that each one of us are called to. So the little commission is a calling to each one of us. And look at the language that Matthew uses here. Having drawn their attention to the need for more workers in this mission field, Jesus underlines the need for the disciples to engage in mission as he commissions them. And Matthew uses a really interesting word here to describe the disciples. And it's a word that we can kind of read and maybe not pay much attention to and gloss over quite easily. And it's the word apostle. Verse 2 of Matthew chapter 10 is the only time in Matthew's gospel that he refers to the 12 disciples as apostles. We might think of that term as a title that we use for the disciples of Jesus and of course it is. Yet it is only in Luke's gospel and in the writings of Paul where it is used as such sense as a title. The other gospels, as it is the case here in Matthew, use the word apostle in the context of mission as one who is sent. And it is a meaning that is inextricably linked to to mission. In this sense then, we are all apostles. We are all messengers of Jesus sent out into the world. And what is it then that we are sent to do? Verses 7 and 8 give us our answer. As you go, says Jesus, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. As we reflect on this commission, it can seem somewhat overwhelming. But I want to break it down for us and what it means for us today. Firstly, as we consider the phrase, the kingdom of heaven has come near, we can get into a lot of theological debate about what that means. But essentially, when we see this phrase in scripture, it might bring our minds back to not only Jesus' teachings, but also those of John the Baptist. Out in the wilderness, John was calling the people to repentance. The word repentance, we can get a little bit bogged down uh, with that word, particularly in our context of the old time gospel preacher out on the street calling people to repent for the end is near. However, repentance is about calling people back from a path that leads to destruction towards a path that leads to life. It's about opening people up to the possibility that their lives can be more fulfilled by God than anything that this world has to offer them. In a world full of darkness and hopelessness, it's about pointing people towards the light and the hope that is Jesus Christ. That's what repentance is. We might be intimidated by the rest of Jesus' statement, heal the sick, Raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. And I want to emphasise this morning that I do believe in the supernatural power of God. I, I, I don't think you can be a Christian and not believe that God has incredible supernatural power that he uses in the, wor- the world today. And I believe that he calls each one of us to operate in that same power given to us by his spirit. Now, it can be a complicated subject when we consider things like healing and faith and all the miracles that we see in the early church. And I think there's a lot of preachers and theologians who have done a better job than I of unpacking what that means. However, I want to say this. I want to say that God's power extends over the natural as well as the supernatural. I personally have seen and heard of miracles that defy the laws of nature and are therefore by that definition supernatural. God's supernatural work at power. I have seen and heard of stories of people who have been healed of an illness. I've heard stories of people whose lives have been restored in profound ways. And these things do happen far more often than we hear about or what our scepticism will allow us to believe. Yet I also believe that as well as being called to operate in that supernatural power, God wants us to reach out to people in the normal, everyday, mundane, run-of-the-mill stuff. 
There are many people around us who need healed not just of physical illnesses, but also of spiritual afflictions. There are people around us who are spiritually dead inside, who God calls us to reach out to, to bring the light of his hope and resurrection power into their lives. There are people who we will come across, perhaps even on a daily basis, who struggle with a disfigurement of the spirit, a disease of impure thoughts or addictions that ruin and rule their lives, who need our love and our support. Should we seek to see God's supernatural power at work amongst us? Absolutely. But we should also seek to be sent out into the more natural, everyday situations that surround each one of us. The situations where we encounter people who have those day and daily struggles. The situations where God perhaps wants us to enter into and bring some of his love and his hope to those people who find themselves trapped in those kind of situations. Now each one of us will find ourselves in different contexts and God will equip us each in different ways. Yet all of us are called to go and fulfill God's calling, God's commission on our lives. Why? Well at the end of our reading we hear these words. Freely you have received, freely give. We have been blessed by God. Having received his forgiveness and having been given a place in his kingdom and so many other blessings, he seeks to send each one of us out to our neighbours, our friends, our families, our colleagues and yes, perhaps even out into the world to strangers. As we have been reflecting in this post-Easter period on the ending of Jesus' ministry, his earthly ministry, we are reminded that It actually was not an ending, but rather it was a beginning for us, his church. I pray that today we might respond to his call in our lives and that we might see many lives changed in how God's spirit works in and through our lives. Let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the call of Jesus that has extended to each one of us in your church. Lord, as we reflect upon this commission, we pray, Lord, that you will give us courage and boldness, Lord, to step up in the small and in the big ways, Lord, to be led by your spirit, to set aside our own fears and worries, and to trust, Lord, that you will take us to places that you call us to, and that you will be with us in those times. So Lord, we pray that you will raise up amongst your people, Lord, a generation of Christians who are not afraid of the gospel, but who will seize every opportunity to proclaim your message of hope and love to the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Stuart. Having heard God's word and having been in a time of worship, We affirm our faith in God using some words that are based on Ephesians chapter 3. And so let us declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Joan is now going to lead us in our prayers. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, we give thanks for your church throughout the world. Thank you that we are part of a global family of faith that is much bigger than ourselves. Thank you that we belong together as one united body. We pray that you would strengthen the bonds of friendship and love that we share across the world. Please help us to care more deeply for one another, to listen more carefully to one another and to share more generously with one another. 
help us to grow together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we pray for David, our Bishop, and the churches of the diocese. We ask you to bless each parish and draw us more closely together during this period of isolation and separation. Help us to discover new ways to worship together, to learn together, and to bless one another. Show us, Lord, how to love and serve one another more effectively in our local churches. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, travelled through towns and villages, curing every disease and illness, come to our aid now, in the midst of the global spread of the coronavirus, that we may experience your healing love. Heal those who are sick with the virus. May they regain their strength and health through quality medical care. Heal us from our fear, which prevents nations from working together and neighbours from helping one another. Heal us from our pride, which can make us claim invulnerability to a disease that knows no borders. Healer of all, stay by our side in this time of uncertainty and sorrow. Be with the families of those who are sick or have died. As they worry and grieve, defend them from illness and despair. May they know your peace. Be with the doctors, nurses, researchers and all medical professionals who seek to heal and help those affected and who put themselves at risk in the process. May they know your protection and peace. Be with the leaders of all nations. <coughs> Give them the foresight to act with charity and true concern for the well-being of the people they are meant to serve. Give them the wisdom to invest in long-term solutions that will help pre pre prepare for or prevent further outbreaks. May they know your peace as they work together to achieve it on earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Lord, we pray today for the most vulnerable members of our societies, particularly those whose daily struggles are magnified during this period of lockdown. We pray for all who are sick whether as a result of COVID or other health conditions. May they experience your healing touch and know that you are with them. We pray for those who are grieving. May they know your comfort and strength. We pray for those who are living in extreme poverty and who are struggling to make ends meet at a time of reduced support and care. May you provide for their needs and bring your hope in the midst of their despair. We pray for those who are lonely and isolated. May they know your presence and your companionship. We pray for those struggling with mental health issues and addictions. May they experience the peace which passes all understanding. We pray for vulnerable children in our care systems. May they know the stability and security that you bring through your relentless and unconditional love. We pray for those who have been uprooted and displaced from their homes. May they experience your welcome and loving embrace. We pray for all who continue to experience the horrors of violence and war. May they know your protection and may you bring lasting peace to their lands. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who came through death that we may have hope and life in all its fullness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for hearing our prayers and as we move into the coming week, help us to remember our Saviour's words as he sent his disciples out into the world. As you go, proclaim the good news 
the kingdom of heaven has come near. Amen. Thank you, Joan. As our service draws towards a close, we're going to join together in the ancient Irish hymn, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. we pray together asking the Lord to be with us as we go forward into the week ahead. Lord we pray that your grace may always proceed and follow us and make us continually to be given to all good works through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so may the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. And finally, just to remind you, please, to take a photograph of yourselves and to send that through so that we can put it into the introduction of our services in weeks to come. A simple photograph, either smiling or waving, and send that through to me at terence at Thank you.